Welcome, welcome to Sleuth TV Live, the interactive discussion where we explore the topic of engineering efficiency and how to track and improve engineering efficiency over time. My name is Don Brown. I will be your host as we explore this topic together, and I am particularly excited about today's topic. Today, we are going to explore not just how to measure these things, but what to do with it afterwards. So you're measuring door metrics. You're totally bought in. What do you do next? And this is really the interesting part because this is the part that actually can help you change and improve your organization. Oh, how does my team deploy today? Well, I can actually go beyond just telling you how often my team today does deploy today. And I can show you because when we're talking about Dora metrics and particularly deployment frequency, uh, my I'm a co-founder of a company called Sleuth, and that's exactly what we do is we measure the Dora metrics and help you improve. So if I'm talking about my team, I might as well just show you. It's just it's always so much better just to show than tell. You know what I mean? So this is Sleuth right now, and I can look at my team, and if I want to answer that question, how often do I deploy, I can look and I can say 5.79 times a day on average. Let's zoom that out. This is looking at the last two weeks, but let's zoom it out in the quarter. And okay, it looks like it's gone up a little bit. So 6.74 times is how often my team deploys every day. And that's every weekday. Now I could, oh, the next part of the question, sorry, is not just how often do we deploy today, but how happy I am with it. And I have to be honest with you, uh, I'm not super happy about this number. And the reason is up until probably six months ago, we were releasing, and in fact, actually, I could be able to find, let's see if let's, this is always fun to do something completely live. Let's see if this works as I'm hoping it will. Let's go from November and let's say till August 1st here. What are the stats? Yeah, so you can see that actually our deployment frequency averaged over everything is about 6.5 times a day. But we used to be only four developers and now we're almost double that. And so, and we plan to grow a lot more. So if you ask me how happy I am with deployment frequency, I would say somewhat, but I wanna see that get better. As I add developers, I know communication costs increase, you have to add more structure, efficiency goes down. And that's what, but that's what we're here to talk about today is efficiency. It's about taking what we have and being more efficient with it. And I think our team could improve that efficiency. And that's kind of really the whole crux of what we're talking about today, which is measuring the efficiency is one thing, but then what do you do with it and how do you improve it? And so that is our topic for today. Added a little bit of music to that. I don't know, what do you think? Should, should we keep the music? Did it just be me speaking and it's just quiet? I don't know. I was trying to think of something to, to spice it up a little bit, if you will. So we are talking about what are Dora metrics good for? So if you are all bought into the Dora metrics and uh, in fact, actually right behind me, I have the state of DevOps report, which is where the Dora metrics came from. You're all bought on, you've read that, you maybe read the Accelerate book, Maybe you, we, you even watched last week's episode, and if you haven't, then you can go to Sleuth TV Live's YouTube site, and we have a replay of the episode one from last week where we explored what Dora metrics are in their history. And now you're asking yourself, what do I do with this? And I love the subtitle on this one, <laughs> absolutely nothing, because when we were first looking at our topics and trying to come up with titles for the different um, episodes we wanted to do, this was one of them, which is what are Dora metrics good for? And of course, all I can think of in my mind is absolutely nothing. And I swear to you, that will be the only time I will sing on this show. Although actually, here's a fun fact. I used to be part of a barbershop quartet. It was, as you'd expect, four or was it a quintet? It was four or five people, I forget, it was a while ago. I'm gonna say four. And we actually sung little four-part harmony, harmonies. I don't even think we had the cool hats and the canes to go along with it, but it was fun times. I'm not a great singer. I don't know how that happened and it'll never happen again, but there was a moment where I was in a barbershop quartet. Little known fact. 
Anyways, what were we talking about? Not singing. Oh yes, the music for the thing. No. Oh, what is it good for? Yes. So I had to put that in there just because I, when I was working on the show notes for this, I just kept thinking, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. And that's not true. It's actually the opposite. Don't get the wrong impression. Dora metrics can be quite useful, but I will say, and this was actually brought up by someone else recently, that metrics like Dora metrics, like any other metrics can be completely abused. Um, Igor says to keep the music with a thumbs up. So done. Okay, good. And that was the music on the thing. Probably not the singing. I didn't, I don't think Igor, what do you think? Should I, should I also be singing? Should we have like a, a theme song for each episode? That'd be kind of interesting. Probably a terrible idea, but I love uh, the creativity, the, the thinking things through. Anyways, what is it good for? Oh, metrics. So measuring metrics is good. You can do some amazing things with them, but as anyone who's been in the industry knows, metrics can also be very toxic in the wrong hand. So in that case, I would say metrics, what are they good for? Uh, the other direction, they're actually very bad for you. I feel like there's a clever way I should be saying this, but metrics can be bad. Metrics can be good for nothing and they can be good for something. The other two are very interesting topics. I think we'll cover them in another episode. Let's stick with the positive today, which is what can you do with Dora metrics? And Igor says, uh, for sure, more singing. And I think this is because Igor uh, just loves to have fun at my expense. Although, given this is a live show, that's kind of half the point. So fair enough. Anyways, we're talking about metrics. What are they good for? And I'm gonna talk about four aspects that in my experience, metrics have been good for. These are not the only four things metrics are good for. This is not an exhaustive list. I was just trying to, when I was thinking about this topic, I was wanting to go beyond just talking points like, oh, metrics help you improve your deployment speed by two times. It can do this, it can do that, and just throwing numbers at it. Eh, that's okay. That's kind of meaningless, I find. I'm personally someone who likes more stories. So back in my preaching days, when I traveled around the world preaching, the key to preaching is stories. Give the, the audience, a congregation, whatever it is, something that they can attach to and make be more interesting. So I'm going to go through four aspects of Dora Metrics for, is it better this way or this way? I'm going to go with this way. We'll even do this way where it's all super zoomed in four ways that door metrics can be useful for your team. And without further ado, let's dive right in with more music. Ah, but before I do that, let's have some more ado. I lied. There is not no further ado. There is more ado, which is a little quick recap of what even door metrics are. If you're watching this and thinking you've said this word a lot, but you haven't defined it, you're right. And let's fix that now. So I'm going to give you a super crash course of Dora metrics. And it really all starts with this report, the state of DevOps report. This is a annual survey where it's researchers tried to understand what makes the best companies work. They learned a few things in this report and ended up creating a book called accelerate that further defined four metrics. These are four key numbers that strongly correlate to high performing teams. And these are often called the DORA metrics. DORA stands for the DevOps Research and Assessment, which is a startup group of researchers that originally came up with this and were involved in the State of DevOps report all the way back to 2014. And every year it's going, this is the report last done. They're doing a survey for the next year. If you want to be part of that, you can go and join the survey for 2022's report. Anyways, as part of this report, they looked and discovered four metrics that they keep, sorry, I'm scrolling through here to find them. These four metrics, these four metrics, if you score highly on these, then that statistically correlates to high performing teams. The four metrics are deployment frequency, how often you deploy, change lead time, which is when you deploy, how long does it take to go from first commit to deploying? Time to restore service, which is also known as mean time to recovery. So when you do fail in production, how long until you get back healthy? And finally, change failure rate. When you deploy something to production, what percentage of those fails? 
in their study of over 30,000 organizations, they found that there were basically four categories of performers. And again, they were looking at how this statistically correlates with other things. Four categories. These categories are best to worst. Worst, let's not be too judgy, but let's just say low. Low is better. Don't want to be judgy. Elite, high, medium, and low. And then they figured for each of these metrics, where do you fit? So we were earlier talking about deployment frequency. Um, if you're looking at deployment frequency, then if you want to be in the elite group, then you should be deploying multiple times a day. If you are in the lowest group, then it's fewer than one time per six months. So in my story in the beginning, when I talked about JIRA and Confluence, well, that's definitely in the low category. We were deploying once every six, what did I say, three to six months, sometimes a little bit longer. So we were definitely in the low category. These are the metrics that we talked last week about what they are, how to measure them, the history of them, all that kind of stuff. And then today, let's say that you have decided, yes, these are useful metrics. I want to do a measure. I do want to measure them. Now what do I do? And here's where I go back to my original thing. We are going to talk about four strategies or value that I've personally gotten out of measuring Dora metrics. And hopefully some of these are useful for you. And if you have any more or would like to tell me I'm wrong, I always like to be told I'm wrong. Please, please let me know in chat. Always looking for back and forth. I used to, I mean, I, used, I remember when I was, this is probably unnecessary information, but I'm going to tell you anyways. So when I was 12, I had a best friend, a female best friend, and she reminded me of this. I completely forgot about it. I saw her about four or five years ago. She said, what we used to do, we used to spend like three hours on the phone, as you do, right, when you're 12, especially with a member of the opposite sex or whoever you're attracted to, although we wouldn't admit at the time. Anyways, way too much personal information. But what we used to do is take a topic and then almost flip a coin and say, who wants to take one side of the topic? Who wants to take the other? And then we'd spend the next two hours arguing that topic. Now, there is something to be said for a 12-year-old's attention span. And when they get fixated on something, boy, they can go forever. Anyways, that was a super long, mostly irrelevant way to say, I'm always looking for other opinions. Now, let's dive right in. And I forgot I had this interstitial, but this is where I say, and we're going to talk about what can these Dora metrics use, be used for. Number one. I kind of like that music. I wonder if I should mix up the music every time or not. Anyways, so sorry, we are 18 minutes into the show and now we're getting to the meat, the meat of the discussion, which just isn't what are metrics and how great they are, but what do you use them for? And the first reason that I find it's useful to measure my metrics is assessment. So if you remember back to the report, we talked about how the report categorizes the Dora metrics into different groups. What's kind of nice about this is when you're a development team out there working on what you're working on, surrounded by your own problems, sometimes you don't really come up for air and you don't really understand how your team really fits in with everybody out there. And that's where an assessment can be a useful thing. So if you're thinking, my team's awesome, we are executing great from an efficiency standpoint, and then you measure the door metrics, and then you go back to these categories and you go, oh, actually we're medium, or we're high in this one category and low in these others, or it takes us days to restore service when we go down. Well, that's not great. Although more than six months, how do you have a mean time to recovery of more than six months? I feel like you would constantly be down which, yeah, that raises more questions than it, than it does answers. But anyways, the point is, is if you're wanting to know out there, you have a team and you're wondering how efficient that team is, the Dora metrics can be a really useful way to benchmark yourself against other teams. Now, of course, you can't really compare deployment frequency of a mobile app that's deployed every couple of weeks because of Apple's App Store to a SaaS app or a microservice that might be deployed every 20 minutes 
but roughly speaking, you can start to put yourself in the categories. And what's interesting about the study, it's down here, is because since the study has been done every single year, it shows how things are changing. So in the beginning, a lot of people were high. And actually, this is 2018. So this isn't even the beginning. Beginning even goes back before that. And a lot of people were in low to medium. And as DevOps, as an approach, has been adopted by the industry, what we're seeing, or sorry, what this group is seeing, the people who do the survey, is that more and more teams are going into the elite category. And what that means is not just a message to you on what the standard is in the industry, but a little bit of a warning to what your competitors might be doing. So maybe back then deploying once a week was, <clears throat> excuse me, considered avant-garde. You know, maybe you cut back a couple years ago, you're like, I deploy a couple times uh, once a week or two. I'm super fast, everything's great. But the standards have changed. Yes, that would have been cool maybe in 2015 or so, but nowadays we're seeing more and more, and now they say 26% of people, of teams, are now deploying multiple times a day. So that's where the industry is going. Does that mean that's where you go? Does that mean that it's relevant to you and whatever your situation is? No, of course not. You can't, again, metrics. Look, I'm just gonna say this, and I'll say it before, and I'm probably gonna say it almost every episode. Metrics are a tool. They are not the answer. If you don't score well on a metric, does that mean that you're doing it wrong? No, it means that this indicator is indicating something which may or may not be relevant to you in this particular case, in your particular circumstance. So like everything in software, like everything in technology, and you could probably even go philosophical and say most things in life, it all depends on context. So this is a tool, metrics are a tool. And so if you're wanting to know how does my team sit compared to other teams out there and how does industry at large going, 30,000 organizations, remember this isn't five, 10, this isn't someone asking their best friends. This is 30,000 organizations are behind this data. And it says that people are going to deploy more and more frequently, for example. So that's information for you to use. As I said, what do you do with it next? Because assessment is one thing. Now I know, okay, I'm about here, and maybe I wanna go here. Maybe I don't wanna go here. Maybe it's relevant, whatever. That's one use, assessment. Why is that useful? Well, I'm gonna tell you a story. So when I was at Atlassian, this is actually kind of interesting, just talking about deployment frequency. We were at a point where we were deploying Confluence every day. This is when I was part of the Confluence team. And because we were deploying every day, we were starting to get some real momentum. I mean, as a developer, deploying once a day is exciting. That means I can make a change. Millions, potentially millions of people can see that change that day or the next day. That's exciting, that's rewarding to feel like you're really making a difference. However, we started to have incidences and these were not good. And some of these were things that should have been caught. I totally admit that. But instead of saying, hey, let's focus on improving things while keeping the same speed, if not even go faster. What ended up happening was a group of people said, hey, the problem here is we're going too fast. We need to slow down. And then we went from daily releases to every few days to every week or so under the idea that going slow helps. So again, going back to my question, how did assessment help me in this case? Well, assessment, gave me a little bit more confidence that actually the industry is going faster and people that are elite are the ones that are achieving their organizational goals and actually decreasing incidences. So the data says that Confluence was wrong to slow down and release every week. Now, in that particular circumstance, was that maybe the right call? Perhaps, but what it does is it gives me a little bit of context to not just my situation, but the industry at large it can help me make better decisions. So assessment is number one. Let's talk about the number two reason to use, or what to do, I need to have a better way to say that. Number two value of Dorametrics in my experience. This one's a straightforward one. Measure the progress of initiative. And in specifically, I'm talking about initiatives that are related to Dorametrics. Let me give you an example. I'm gonna start with a story this time. We're gonna stop standing up on my podium and giving you a sermon. We're just gonna start with a story. When I joined my last company as a chief architect, they were deploying code every 
three months or so. Now, you might say, well, they had to do it every three months for quality. I don't remember if it was when I was in the office for the interview or if it was when I was in the office for the first week of work. It was something really, really early on. They had an outage that they went down for, I think, in the end, two to three hours, like everything completely down for two to three hours. So it's not like that every three months deployment was really helping them that much. And so what we wanted to do based on my previous experience where we were deploying more frequently, when I ran as a team that managed multiple microservices, we were deploying multiple times a day. I said, I think one of the answers here is to actually increase the frequency of deployment. That'll let us respond to incidences quicker. That'll be more rewarding for the developer. That will help us achieve our business goals, all those wonderful things. So we started on a project where we wanted to deploy every three months and we wanted to get it to the point where we deployed once a day, I think was our goal. And the challenge with one of these initiatives is it takes a lot of resources because people have to make changes to the code base. The code base isn't set up to do that. Our deployment pipelines, I don't even remember if we had a fully automated deployment pipeline. In fact, I think what we had was a document that was like 30 steps long. So we were not set up to do that. We had to spend engineering effort to speed up deployments. We had to put engineering effort around communicating all these changes that are now gonna be happening more and more frequently. The sales team needed to be on board. The marketing team, the support team need, needed to be on board. It's a lot of work. And as part of an initiative that takes a long time, anyone who's done this in a large organization knows a lot of the energy has to go, goes into keeping the momentum of the project justifying why we're doing it again and again and again. You don't decide something and you do it for six months. You have to decide it again and again every single week. And so you need a way to measure. And so one thing that's nice about the Dora metrics is it is a way to completely automatically measure these things. If you're wanting to improve deployment frequency, you should be measuring it and you should be measuring it over time. Just going back to uh, my product, and again, this applies to pretty much any product, you can see how things change over time. And that's rewarding, that's exciting as in anyone who's interested in the project to say, hey, we were down here and now we're up here. Look at it over time. That's, that's what helps you maintain that momentum through long projects. So the second value I've found of measuring your door metrics is if you actually wanted to improve one of them, maybe it's deployment frequency, maybe it's minimizing change lead time, maybe it's reducing your incident rate, the first step is to measure it and then continue measuring it throughout your process. And I'll say one more thing on this real quickly that I feel like keeps getting misunderstood. I talk to a lot of people out there who are wanting to transform an organization and they say, well, let us do this transformation. And when it's done, then I want to start measuring Dora metrics. And that's, I understand where they're coming from. And in their particular case, it might be the right thing. But my recommendation is no, what you want to do is you want to measure at the beginning so that as you're doing your transformation, your stakeholders can see the progress and be having their decision confirmed again and again and again. So measuring of an initiative is good in the beginning, throughout, and then when you're done. But that's not all. Now let's say you get to where you want. Well, what happens if you have a completely unrelated change that changes something? You think, ah, I got my deployment frequency, just like I did for my team. Six times a day, we're good, we're done. But things change, right? In engineering, things are changing all the time, such as we might have adopted a microservice ar architecture versus a normal architect uh, monolith architecture. We might have moved from Python to Go or Go to Ruby. I don't know if anyone moves to Go to Ruby. That might not be a greatest example. Anyways, the point is things change in your organization. And so it's not just enough to hit where you wanna be, but it's about measuring that and tracking that over time so that you stay where you are, where you want to be over the long haul. So when I think about tracking the impact of related change, I think about something like Confluence. Confluence, we were a monolith. We were like a three or five million line code base of a monolith. And we were trying to move to microservices. And we did not have something like Dora metrics or Sleuth at that time, which is unfortunate because basically what you have to do is as you have that justification speech throughout that migration is you have to say, ah, oh, things are going great. And then people say, great, 
where's your proof of that? Where's your data? Where's your metrics? And you say, uh, it's going great. And that's not good enough. You need to have an understanding of the progress of unrelated things. As we're going to microservice, how did that change our deployment frequency? How did that change our change lead time? I would hope it got way better, but I don't know that. I'm just guessing. And so by measuring, you can actually put some of the numbers behind it that'll help you with this unrelated change, number one. But number two, as this change is happening, you can just verify that it's not breaking something. Think of it kind of like door metrics can be like unit tests. They're an insurance policy that you put in place so that as you do things later, you make sure that you're not breaking something. Ooh, unit tests would be a very interesting topic. That's another, another season of Slew TV Live. I wonder if we keep the same music on each section point or if I have to change it up. Because I have to admit, hearing the same song, it gets a little repetitive. I don't know. What do you think, Igor? Should we keep it? Should we not? Let me know. Number four, the fourth reason why you should track your Dora metrics is to track the impact of team scale events. So it goes like this, your team, and this is exactly what happened to me as I mentioned in that example in the beginning. <laughs> Freebird, we should play Freebird. We actually can, there is a service where you can license copyrighted music. Uh, that would be kind of interesting. Pick different copyrighted music things and yeah, that'd be fun. I like it. Unless you meant something else by Freebird, in which case maybe that too. Igor says, uh, maybe change it up from segment to segment. Yeah, that's a good idea. I need to play with it more. I'm not really a music person. I would appreciate it. But yes, good observation. Noted for the second. I'll tell my producer. I, I actually, we do have a content person at Sleuth, and I called her my producer the other day, and I was like, ooh, I like that. I have a producer. Anyways, uh, the number four reason is teams change. Team scales up, team scales down. Team scales from one group into three sub teams. However, team things change. One of the key reasons why you make changes is, <laughs> oh wait, hold on, before I finish even my own sentence, Katie is my producer. Oh, I can be like those TV shows where they say, oh, my producer tells me, well, there we go. Katie says has a nice ring to it. So Katie says, yes, she is a producer. Uh, I am just, I am I'm the talent. I am the, the minion and she is a producer. Perhaps she has a spokesman. Yeah, I could be the spokesman. I like that, I like that. So we have producer and a spokesman. Look at this, we're growing up, very exciting. All right, back to this. If you are measuring your Dora metrics, one of the Fourth reason that I found useful is to track your metrics, your delivery performance. Because remember, these door metrics are measuring your delivery performance, tracking them through team scale events. So if you're a company like us, it's growing a lot. We're trying to add people, which by the way, if you are a developer out there and you are wanting to work at the best place you possibly could, then sleuth.io is the place for you. Apply today because we're trying to hire a ton of people. Anyways. As this happens, the growth we've had so far and the growth that we're planning to have happen, I want to make sure that my delivery performance is at best unchanged and ideally improves over time. I want to see that the onboarding processes that I put in place are getting people going faster. I don't want to see things like my change lead time going down. I want to see that ideally remaining the same or maybe even getting better. So as a manager, as someone who's going through a growth phase and hiring new teams, new people in different geos, remote people, local people, whatever, I want to understand the impact on my delivery performance for those people. So this is something that I personally am using Sleuth for and Dora Metrics for right now is tracking this information to help me make decisions. When have I hired too quickly? Have I taken the new people and have I attached them to enough senior people that can help them get it onboarded. And that's really kind of an interesting one. Just to say a little bit more about that, just because it's always fun to see something other than my face. I'm gonna go back to Sleuth and we're gonna take a look at the last, I'm just gonna say 28 days. And we're gonna look at the change lead time. This one is particularly interesting because if I'm having a team scale, I'm adding a bunch of people, I wanna make sure they're not getting stuck. What is one of the places that people get stuck the most? In a pull request or merge request if you're a GitLab person out there. 
It's when the new person has made a change and then they didn't know all the right things to do. And then all the seniors and other devs start piling on the pull requests and say, oh, you did this wrong. You did this wrong. They fix it. Oh, you did that fix wrong. They do this. Oh, the coding style is wrong. Oh, we like to name our variables this. And it cycles and cycles and cycles. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It really is really important to educate new developers on how your team likes to work so that you have cohesion. The more cohesion you have, the better team morale you have, the better performance, the better consistency, easier debugging. I could go on and on. Anyways, where this metrics can come into play is I can look at my door metrics over time and I can dig into this and say, has my review time gone up? So my review time is the time as Sleuth measures it. And again, this could work for many other tools. Every tool kind of does it differently. But this is measuring from the moment that I ha first had a review to when the code has started to be deployed or the pull request merge, mer merge request merged. Merge request merged? This sounds weird. Anyways, it's that point. So if I'm looking on wanting to understand how my new devs are being onboarded, this is going to be one of the key metrics that I'm going to pay attention to, my review time. And I want to measure that over time. And as you can see, it kind of has gotten bigger a little bit. So that tells me as a manager that I need to get better at onboarding my new devs so that they get successful quicker and less stress on my experienced devs. So to me as a manager at this moment right today, this is giving me actionable information that I'm taking a note of and going to go talk to my team about after this. So that's where metrics can go just from a th one thing just from a, a measurement to say, great, hooray, to actual actionable information. And that's probably my one more thing. If I wanted to do a one more thing in this talk, it's to say how metrics are good to know for sure, but metrics should not be the answer. Metrics, any metrics, but especially Dora metrics in this particular case, Dora metrics should help you ask the right questions. And then it's your re response to these questions that helps improve your team. So the Dora metrics tells me my change lead time has gone up. And that lets me ask, why has it gone up? Oh, my review time's gone up. Why has that gone up? Oh, because I have new people. Why has that happened? Kind of the five whys if you've ever done incident management. And then that makes me question, why is this happening? Oh, maybe my onboarding isn't so good. Maybe I have been dropping these new devs into nothing and hoping they succeed. And that's clearly not the case as borne out by metrics. And so it says, why is my onboarding not good? Okay, let's come up with five strategies that I can do to improve my onboarding. So it goes from just this theoretical high level number that you think, oh, I just needed to report to management or exec team. And it turns into something that me as a developer, as a team lead, as an engineer can use to make, to ask the right questions and make changes that help my team today in very con concrete ways. So this is where, as I said, metrics become real. Okay, I think the music was cool, but it does get a little bit too much. In fact, no, I'll turn it off next time. So you have one more time, two more times you get to hear the music, and then we'll figure out something next time. Our Dora metrics are some bad teams. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is something that I hear sometimes, which is I already measured my Dora metrics. We're looking good. Why do I need to keep doing metrics? And I would refer to you to point two, three, and four of this of this talk where I talked about how metrics are not just good when something changes and when things are great or to get great, but even once you're great, it's good to measure to make sure you stay great. So keep that in mind. It's not just a one-time thing. In my opinion, it's something you should be continuously measuring. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna turn that off. One more time. Okay, all done with that. That was one too many times. Final thoughts. Final thoughts is any kind of tool you adopt, be ruthless. If it doesn't do any value for you, you might be missing something, but also it might not be the right tool for you. And Dora metrics should be no different. The answer is not to door to measure metrics. That's not what be helps you become an efficient team. Using Dora metrics as a tool to ask better questions, to make real things change in your team to improve your efficiency. That's where the value lies. And so that's what I challenge you to think about. But this is just all my opinion. Let's bring in, wait, let me see if I can find him. Let's bring in 
Uh, a second opinion. I think I even have a graphic for it. A eh, graphic. We'll use that word loosely. I'm going to bring to the conversation, everybody welcome, my good friend. Make sure I get the right button here. I think I don't have the right button. Go to this button. Oh, no. Hold on. <laughs> this is the fun of doing a live show. I brought Dylan in and then proceeded to um, screw up something. But I'm going to fix it right now. It's going to be awesome. And Dylan is going to join us. Dylan, can you hear me? Dylan, can you hear me? Dylan cannot hear me. Dylan, hear me now. Great. I think we're working. You... Okay. That's going to be fun. <laughs> so one thing that's about this, we actually, this was working earlier. I swear to God. One thing that's about this is that the YouTube stream is about 10 seconds delayed. So you'd think that you could just watch the stream and then catch up on what's going. But that is not the case. Let's see if I can figure out why the thing is happening really quickly. But Dylan, here, I'll tell you what. We are going to... All right, we are going to do it live because that's how it goes. I'm going to ask Dylan a question, and Dylan is just going to respond. Okay, so Dylan just got a question, and let's hear what he has to say. Um, maybe he didn't get the question. Then, like, Uh, okay, let me say what we're talking about is earlier we were talking about deployment. Oh, do you not hear? Oh, do you guys just hear me? You do just hear me. We can't hear Dylan. Oh, that makes it fun. All right. <laughs> Where did that go? Uh, okay, hold on. Let me see if I can figure out what's going on here and do it live. That is clearly the best way. No, that's not it. All right. Well, we are going to say goodbye to Dylan as much as I want to talk to Dylan. <laughs> Dylan is there. He has so many things to say, so many exciting things to say, but he cannot say them. And as much fun as I'm sure it is to watch me try to figure something out during the stream, uh, let's not do that, shall we? So what I'm going to close with, because we're getting about close to time, is I want to talk about the next episode. So, so far we've talked about how you can measure your Dora metrics and how you can improve them over time. Uh, and then we talked about, well, sorry, we talked about how to measure your metrics. And then we also talked about how you can use these metrics. So it's not just theory, but it's actually something that, that is actionable. There is a big elephant in the room, in my opinion, when we talk about the metrics and just to kind of remind you of what the metrics are going back to this, we have four main metrics here, deployment frequency, change lead time, MTTR and change failure rate. These two metrics right here don't ever define what is failure. And in fact, this is, in my opinion, one of the big missing things that when you're talking about door metrics and how to measure them, the people do not measure or at least think seriously about, and that is how do you define failure? The very simple answer is, oh, I rolled back, so failure. Okay, great. But 
Maybe you had an incident that didn't, maybe your team doesn't do rollbacks. Maybe your team only does roll forwards. Maybe your team, that isn't a good measurement. So maybe you want to measure incidences. Maybe you want to measure metrics. Maybe you want to measure when status page happens. A message goes up on status page or pager duty. Maybe when an incident happens on pager duty. These kind of things, these are all different ways that you can measure failure. And what's interesting about it is this is something per team. So what I want to do is I want to use this as a forum, and I'm going to tell you my reason, and then I'm going to tell you my real reason afterwards on why I want to do this. Because I think if you're going to measure failure, if you're going to measure the door metrics, you need to have a discussion about what is failure, why it's important to measure it, and how you measure it. And so we were originally not going to do an episode next week, but now we are. It's going to be a bonus episode. I think I'm going to call it episode 2A or something like that, because episode 3 is in two weeks. And we're going to talk about what is failure. So if you're out there trying to measure your door metrics and you want to measure mean time to recovery or change failure rate, you need to define what failure is. And so I have a whole talk about how to measure failure. So that is a good reason why we're going to do that next week. The other real reason is I'm going to be speaking at DevOps in DevOps World in Orlando at the end of September. And my title of talk is going to be, does failure happen if no one's around to measure it? And then I'm going to talk about failure. And I thought, you know what? We have this live show here, and I would love to be able to go through the content with you, see if it resonates, see if it's accurate, see if there's any feedback you have, like, oh, this part doesn't make sense, or you need to go into more detail here. I'd love to get your thoughts, and I figure I need to practice it anyways, might as well have you helped me because I'm always looking for help. So that's what's going to happen on Sleuth TV Live next week, episode 2A. We are going to, maybe we'll end up naming it to 3 because why not, right? Episode 3, I'm just going to, I'm going to make executive decision. Episode 3, we're going to talk about what failure is, how to measure failure, why you need to measure failure, what you do with failure once you measured it, that kind of thing. So it's going to be a deep dive into this topic that you can either watch then and or you can come to DevOps World in Orlando on September 27. I think, let me look that up actually. DevOps World 2022. This is going to be in Orlando where you'll find me on the agenda. I believe I'm the first day and we're going to talk about fire there as well. So if you want to come meet me in person, that's a great place to do it. If you want to just learn about failure, then you can either come next week or watch the replay. By the way, there will be a replay of this episode where we talked about how to use Dora metrics and how they've been practical for me personally, and hopefully in a way that might be useful to you. And that wraps up our session today. Thank you very much for my very forgiving guest, Dylan, that we got to see him briefly and not hear him. Clearly more practice and more logistics I need to work on there. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the conversation. It was fun to be able to go back and forth. Feel free to come next time or check us on the replay. And until then, I need to come up with something clever to say at the end, like stay classy San Diego, something like that. Until then, see you next time.